we're required uh, by the State Department as one of our areas is to, to track our ACT trend data for five years. And so um, the first several slides are going to be our five-year trend data with the ACT. Um, so as a district, um, total tested, we talk about this every year. You can see that it, it keeps continually going up from 2015 uh, to 2018, um, where we topped out at 193 students. And so um, the state has helped with that because they do fund um, the uh, testing, and so there's more kids that are testing now. Um, there's a, a look at the state. Um, as you can see, just like we talked about, um, as we're growing, the state is growing just because of the state is providing funding. We did dip a little bit um, from 2017-18 as a state, um, a little bit of the amount that were tested, uh, but we're still um, showing that increase of the amount of students that are taking the ACT. So this is just based on the junior class last year? Or is no, this, th this, is, this is the seniors that um, graduated last year the last test that they took um, when we get ready to do the um, grade cards um, Mr. Legrand um, when he gets up here that will be the juniors um, the test that they took for uh, their subject test so this was the seniors that graduated last year their last ACT score that they took so they could have took six tests but it's the last one that they took this report it's, not, it's not an aggregate of all their students I'm sorry, but I'm back on page on the total tested. Um, does that include the sophomores, juniors, and seniors that, that took the test, the 193, or is that just a... That right there would have just been the seniors. That would, okay, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Um, so for the English, um, when you look across there, uh, across the five-year trend, um, we did take a dip um, this year. And I'd like to tell everybody you're not comparing apples to apples because these are different kids every year, um, you know, with different uh, things that are going on um, and where they're at. And so this is one thing Mr. LeGrand and I talked about is, you know, we took a dip. What are we doing? Um, we went back and kind of discussed some things. And so I know when Mr. LeGrand gets up, he's going to talk a little bit of what they're doing at the high school. But um, we had a pretty good trend, and we're trying to get to that uh, state average. And one thing I didn't say is you're going to see all our district is in blue and the state average is in red and all the slides that we present tonight. And so a um, little behind there, um, we took a step back. And so um, we're going to work on that as a district to uh, try to get that um, to state average and higher. Hey, Doug, whenever I was looking through this, when did we switch to the new standards, teaching standards? On the English, was that two years two ago? Years ago. Um, the map, um, when you're looking at that, uh, it's been pretty consistent there. Um, one of the things I would say is, you know, we cut into that um, from 2017 to 2018. Um, still not the same kids, but uh, we closed that gap. And so, you know, looking at that right there, we're getting close to that state average. Um, we're just a, a little bit uh, behind, um, but uh, we're making good trends. And when you see some of the data that we're going to present in a little bit, it makes some sense with our higher um, achieving kids. So. Uh, our reading, uh, basically the same as we were in uh, 2017, we're, we're in 2018. We didn't gain any ground, uh, but we didn't lose any ground. And so um, that's where we're at there. Uh, of course, like I said, we, we keep wanting to at least get to that state average and get higher. Um, the science um, did make a little bit to uh, the state average dropped. Um, we stayed consistent uh, with 18.6 from last year. Um, and so made a little bit of ground there um, and so we'll keep uh, trending trying to get there and this is a composite of all of those um, tests together um, to get your uh, average and so um, as you can see um, we're still about the same um, as we were last year the scores dropped um, but we dropped right there with the state average um, and so um, didn't gain, didn't lose, but uh, still got some work to do. Uh, remediation rate, um, this would have been 2017 seniors, because it takes a year to get that data in. Um, and so when you go back uh, two years, um, we had 1.1% of um, the students that graduated have to take a remediational science class uh, to the state average, is just you can see right there, uh, uh, less than a half. 
Um, the other three, I'm really, you know, uh, I'm pretty proud. We're right there. English, 16.7 um, um, and 16.2 was a state average, so we're really, really close there. Um, and then look at our maths. You know, we really, uh, compared to where the state average is of 34.7, you know, 27.2 of our students had uh, take remediation. So, um, and then um, the last one there is reading. reading. And um, we're at 5.4 of our students when the state average is 9.3. And so I, I think we're doing some good things um, with our students there, getting them ready for the ACT. I know Mr. LeGrand and his staff are still working on ways um, to prepare them. And so having a senior at home uh, right now, um, I know that we are looking at different ways to get the students prepared as well. So this, uh, this slide that you see right here is I would say the most significant uh, measure of what we're doing. And uh, when, when they go to the next level and they don't require as much remediation as the state average as we are accomplishing at the high school. But why wouldn't those numbers <coughs> seem to contradict the ACT schools in the math? Well, I think the district ACT mathematics I don't have the answer to that. Well, too, you got to realize <clears throat> that not all these kids that took the ACT are going to college. And so the bottom line is you're, probably your top end kids are the ones that are ultimately going on to college. And so those kids are not requiring as much remediation as just anyone. Yeah. That makes sense. I think yeah, it's an important sense. point because remember that when the state two years ago started paying for all of our seniors to take the ACT. Previously, the kids that were in, at least targeted for being college bound were the only ones taking it. Now, all of our seniors are taking it. And you can see how, as those numbers jumped, they jumped with students that would otherwise probably not take that test. And I think that's a significant portion of this when you look at the history, the historical data that skews it. One of the things I want to say before I go into the dropout report is the ACT as is reported here is actually a score and so those are what students and so that's the average when Mr. LaGrange gets up and talks about the junior test it's going to be a percentage of the students that meet college readiness and so I wanted to say that so when you start looking at the when he gets up here it's not this we're not looking at scores it's, it's going to be a little bit different to how they uh, present that. Okay, so the secondary uh, are required to have a dropout report or an exit report. And so seventh grade, I wanted to show you, these are kids that when we started the school were on our rolls and then um, exited somehow and did not get into um, another school uh, that was a diploma issuing school. Um, and so we had 35 in seventh grade that exited to another school, uh, one dropout, one exited to homeschooling and 253 finished out the year. So in, in eighth grade, um, we had 36 that exited to another school, three dropouts, two exited to suspension, and then 227 finished out the year. So four dropouts out of about 510 students. Uh, and so uh, those are students that may end up coming back um, or go to another school, but as when they run this exit report, if they are not in another diploma school and they're still not on our books, they're considered a dropout. Uh, the high school, ninth grade, we had uh, 39 that exited to another school. We had 12 dropouts, one exited to homeschooling, one exited to suspension, and then 200, 256 finished out the year. Tenth grade, we had 23 exit to another school, eight dropouts, one exited to homeschooling, one exited to suspension, and then we had 273 finished out the year. 11th grade, 16 exited to another school, 11 dropouts, and then 219 finished out the year. And in 12th grade, um, we had four exit to another school, nine dropouts, one exit to another home school, one exit suspension, 13 finished out the year. We had 188 graduate. 
Um, on the 13 finished out the year, that just means they did not meet the requirements to graduate. We have several of those 13 that over the summer or back in the, the fall will come back, but they do count um, that they did not graduate on our graduation report. And so if you put all that 9 through 12, we have about 4% of our students that dropped out. Okay, Dad. Huh? When you say on the 12th grade, 188 graduated, and then back to page 2, we talked about 193 seniors took the ACT, are you telling me that almost 95% of the class took ACT tests? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And we're required, um, when we start talking about uh, the other tests, we have to test at least 95% of our students. So 95% took the ACT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get deemed if we do not test at least 95%. <coughs> so, how did that drop our rate? How did that compare to previous years? Anything to to? It's, it's pretty significant, about the same. Um, we When we go back and look at that, and I'll add that next year so we can go back and put, I'll do another three or four year down and we have committees over in that next time, but it's pretty close to the same. Um, we see that in ninth grade, um, we do have a lot of kids that make it in high school. Um, they get in there, they drop out. As you can see, as we come through the same trend, Abby, is by the time they get to seniors, the dropouts are really low. Of course, they're about to graduate. And so uh, the dropouts that we usually have there are the kids that get really behind. And, but one of the things that the high school administration staff has done is starting their junior year, if their credits are way behind, we offer them favor right away to get them caught back up and go to alternative school. And so they're catching those and monitoring those early. And so that's why our dropout rate is going down a little bit. Graduation point out. One of the things that is that we need to issue a caveat here on when we look at historical dropout path is the state has changed the definition of a dropout uh, about three times since in the in the last 12, 13 years. And so it's hard to compare uh, over a long period of time and have it truly be apples to apples. And the, as they've made those changes, they've, they've made it more sensible, um, but it's still uh, still difficult to compare other than in small bits. Any other questions? So I was curious, the, uh, all these grades, there are a lot of kids exiting to another school. Are they being replenished by kids coming from other schools to our district? Well, so our, our enrollment numbers are pretty static throughout the year? Our, our enrollment is about even because if we, we go back on October 1 count of what we look at that we just finished and uh, we were actually up, I believe it was seven students and so we, we've been gaining about as much. Um, our ADM did go up, um, I believe it was, what did I tell you today, that they told us 47 students I believe. Yeah, and so, um, we are going up a little bit, um, but uh, one of the things that we're tracking and the registrars are, are where are these students going? And so we'll have some data to be able to, to find out, um, you know, where are they exiting to? They're going to other public schools, they're going private, are they going charter? And so we'll have some data that we'll be able to look at that as well. Anything else for me? based on them changing the code scores on the testing. 
Um, we are working toward bringing those math scores up. Of course, we are you know, dissecting those new standards uh, bit by bit. We're looking at our data, looking at data, and looking at data, tracking every single one of those students um, across the board and can pretty much nail by the end of the year who's gonna, who's gonna pass and who's gonna fail that test. Uh, we are intervening and trying to remediate uh, as much as we can for third grade, but that's um, something that we continue to work on. For our reading, um, again, they adjusted those cut scores to, I believe, the national level. So the state average was 34% proficient, and Bogue News was 16% proficient. I went back and total our RSA numbers for this so that we would have those, and the state average for RSA was 78%, and Bogue News RSA numbers were 67%. That's the portion that they have to pass. Um, the reading comprehension and vocabulary portion of the test that they have to pass to be promoted for the RSA. For the RSA? Mm -hmm. Yes, if the state average was 78% and the average was 67%. And just because I'm not familiar with the vernacular, RSA? Is the Reading Sufficiency Act, which is part of our um, Oklahoma law. Third grade reading. The, the no, third grade right. reading. Third grade reading law slash RSA. <laughs> yes. Marcia, is third grade the first official state testing we see? Yeah. It is. So <coughs> this is kind of where we see where we're starting with. Yes. Okay. Yes. We're, we're collecting lots of data um, over the, you know, and I'm really anxious to do that with neighborhood schools. Um, but tracking those kids from first, second, third grade, um, all the way up. So this year we have a good line of data on our third graders all the way back from kindergarten um, to kind of help us, you know, see if they, how they've grown each year, if they have the same gaps and what we're doing there. Any more questions? fourth grade ELA, 31% of the district and 30 36% of the state. One thing we've always done is with having fourth grade guests, we're able to start looking at that now, um, working with fourth grade teachers, but they're with the neighborhood schools. But my fifth grade teachers are looking at this because they're looking at what standards were they weak at in the fourth grade so that they can make sure they're building on those and covering those even more in depth um, when they get to the same Type standards. Fifth grade, we saw some growth. We have 31% at the district average, and that was 1% above the state average. But how do you brag on that when it's still 31%? So uh, we're glad we're above the state average, but we know we still have uh, places to go. Our ELA is 39%. Again, fifth grade above the state average. The state average was 37% in the language arts. The science, we were just 1% below state average, and that's much closer than we have been in the past, so we were really excited about that growth there. Um, one thing I would say about fifth grade, uh, it will start the online test this year, and as one of the parents had mentioned, fifth grade is the writing test, so they will be actually doing their writing portion on the keypad. We have been working towards that. Uh, all of our iPad cards were replaced over the summer with Chromebooks to where there is actually a keyboard that they're using. And so that, basically I have to where every class at one grade level could have technology in their classroom. I have six Chromebook carts and then the three computer labs are still in place. So uh, we do have that to where at least every class every day could be on one grade level. But basically the way they have it is each team of about three teachers shares that so that each day they can be transferring it. So we do, we are working towards that technology. Susan, mm -hmm. are they learning how to type? 
are they just pet? No, that is actually when I talk about sixth grade, which granted sixth grade is not doing the writing test, fifth grade is. Now they're trying to start that. We used to have a program at Guess long ago. And so they're doing some online. They found an epic that they're working on. And so they're working on, on uh, keyboarding in fifth grade. But it's a bad place to start when they've got to take that writing test. But they're doing the best they can. And I know we've talked about it within the principles that we need to start at those lower grades with that keyboard. So they figured out they can't use their thumbs. <laughs> so they're trying it. They're trying it. But it's not working for them. So we're working at it. Um, so um, sixth grade math. We are at uh, the state average was at 28%. Again, we were at 33%. We're above that state average, but we still want to continue growing. Sixth grade ELA, 35%. Uh, we were a little bit below the state average there at 38%. One thing sixth grade's looking at is we're trying to, we're kind of following up uh, something that the junior high's done. We're trying to, in our last 35 to 40 minutes of the day, doing a study skills with the students who did not pass the state test. And about every three to four weeks, they switch. One week, we'll focus on the ELA. The ELA teachers are doing intervention with those kids who didn't pass. The other classes are doing some type of enrichment. We've got anything from life skills, newspaper, uh, just different things. Teacher, one teacher's just doing art. Things that we've had to not focus on in the curriculum because of focusing on that. So students who pass the test are doing some of those. Um, and then the next set will be mapped and we'll pull those kids who haven't taught the map. And then I know just now they're gonna redo some maps testing to see if we've had some growth. And you know, that's kind of an incentive for those kids to grow in their skills as they can get out of that class and start doing other, we call them electives, if they, as they grow. So that's one of the new things we're trying in sixth grade to build on this. Any questions? I'm just curious with what you just said about them having to start taking their test online and typing and stuff. Do you expect statewide that's going to be a disaster? Do you think everybody else knows how to type? I mean, I just don't see that being easy for these kids to do. That I don't think it will be. I mean, we were still working on getting kids to write really well. You exactly. know, the writing test. So I, I think statewide it's going to be a, a difficult thing for them. In what grade is that? Fifth. Fifth Fifth and eighth grade of the writing test. So I'm curious, kind of curious or interested since we're talking about elementary. As my boys were going through the lower grades, it seemed like there was some experimentation with team teaching, rotating mm -hmm. classrooms, and it seemed like going back to one teacher. We're still yeah, team teaching. We're still team. I was wondering mm -hmm. if, if, you know. Mm -hmm. Sixth grade is also even trying to break it up more and doing more of the junior high type schedule just because we felt like some of their disadvantages at sixth grade are those kids are older. And if they traveled with the same kids all day, that's when in the afternoon they felt like they were having some discipline problems. So they're trying to break up the kids they're with to where they're not with the same kids all day. Actually, in sixth grade. And, and the same thing for the lower grades. Yeah. Just for teen teaching? Yeah, it's still teen teaching or back just a whole other teacher. This year, since we went to neighborhood schools and um, we're kind of odd in numbers, we have not we are, we are not teen teaching this year. questions for me? All right, thank you guys. Thank you. All right, for the junior high uh, seventh grade math, uh, state average was 35% and we were at 39%. Um, I'm just going to run through these. You guys stop me and I'm going to ask something. Seventh grade ELA, 28% uh, for both us and the state average. Um, for eighth grade math, the state average was at 20%, and uh, district at eighth grade level was 38%. And for ELA, 34% at the state level and 39% um, here in Guthrie. And for science, um, again, I think I said this last year that for several years we stood up here and science was the scapegoat, and now they're the highest average statewide. So. Figure it out. Figure it out now. Uh, I think that has something to do with it as far as um, our scores in relation to the state average, but my comment was more related to for a while the state average for science was in the bucket. Everybody's like, what are we doing? Science, science, science. And how it's the highest. So just 
uh, statewide. So it's it's trying to figure out where that's going to land or what they're looking for is kind of difficult at times. But um, we're we're pretty pleased. Um, it's kind of like what um, Susan said, though. Um, even though we're at or above state average and every subject, it's hard to get excited about a 40. You know, but um, we are um, we're pleased, but we're not satisfied. Type of situation. We're going to keep working, trying to get better. Um, one thing that I said last year, and I'll reiterate again today, is that research has shown that what what a normal eighth grade kid is doing in math today is what the average senior in high school did in math. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what you're really going to start to see um, when they when they talk about rigor, I don't think they've really figured out what rigor means to them. So they just take a higher grade level and fall down on a lower grade level and say it's rigor as opposed to keeping it at the same grade level and asking tougher questions. Um, higher level thinking skills and taxonomy and that sort of thing. But, um, I think what you're really going to see is you're going to start to see, because um, this being the second year, with these type of scores in relation to a national test that um, is not a grade level test, um, you're going to see a lot of fluctuation from year to year because you're going to have one year where Kids just aren't ready to be a senior when they're in eighth grade. And then you have another year where you have a large group of kids that can handle that type. You know, it's just, it's, it's very developmental. And I think we're, um, well, I know we are at times asking kids to do more than what they're developing capable of doing at the time. But um, anyway, I, th I think you'll see a large fluctuation in that from year to year as we keep going through this. and. And especially as long as they keep moving this to a national test, it's on a great level test. So, but, any questions? Do you all still offer keyboarding? Yes, keyboarding is um, every kid will take that um, so one nine weeks. It's in a rotation with our creative writing classes. Um, what we found with our creative writing is um, less is more. Um, we can get more out of kids by asking them to write. 18 essays as we can by asking them to write 40 essays. They will, they will stay hooked up. Uh, once you get into the third nine weeks and they're still writing the same type of essays over and over and over again, you suddenly start to see, oh, does the quality go down, but the quantity go down. Also, you have a whole lot less kids doing them, um, and they're doing them to be doing them and not getting better at them. So um, we have those, um, each kid will take a semester of creative writing and a nine weeks of keyboarding. And in that fourth nine weeks, what we do is we take the kids and we kind of see where they need help before they go into state testing. And when we do our <coughs> test prep, or I think they call it boot camp at high school, or whatever you want to call it, um, we put those kids where we think they need to be. <coughs> and especially depending on what they're going to be asked to do um, in April. Um, seventh grade, we're, not, we're probably not going to put them as heavy in the writing during that time because their writing portion of the test is basically just grammar. Um, and that sort of thing. We're not really writing uh, an entire essay, but we want our eighth graders definitely to be um, practicing more essays during that time. So we try and stagger. We we stagger the nine weeks depending on what um, that the, that group of kids is going to be taking in April. Um, we try not to set up anything in relation to testing, but we also want to prepare for what they're going to be held accountable to when April rolls around. So and their written test is is keyboard um, Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the keyboarding is very important, obviously. So, um, and, and it's not just important for the writing test. It's it's very beneficial for those kids to know how to use a keyboard before they go into computer apps as a freshman. In high school, Chris and I talked about that numerous times. And if we get rid of keyboarding um, at the junior high and don't have it at the lower levels, then those kids aren't going to learn how to type until they get into they're not going to type accurately until they get into um, high school at the freshman level and it puts them behind in taking their computer apps classes or whatever those technology classes are. But yes, I do think our STEM program has been very beneficial to that and, and the changes we've made with that, making it a core class for every student um, and still offering the elective classes, which we call the um, our world classes. We have building our world, exploring our world. And, um, those type of things, and so they really build rockets, build bridges, and um, learn how to create apps, and all those type of things. Um, but as far as moving our STEM as a core class, it's not only benefit our scientists, 
that's helping them out because our um, that puts our STEM teacher now on a team of teachers that gets to meet with the math teacher and the science teacher regularly, just like everybody else does, and so they can really plan their uh, lessons in conjunction with uh, the topics that are going on in the regular classroom as well. Do you think it like, attributes to why the eighth grade math score statewide is so significantly low? I mean, it's so much lower. It's 20%. It's, it's, I mean, it's <clears throat> I can give you the answer, I hope that it's not going to be politically correct, so <laughs> stop me whatever you want to. Well, I'm just curious, I mean, because it's just, it's significantly lower than the state average on all the, way, the other the subjects, way these, so. The way the, the way the test is being done is the argument became, why is Oklahoma so, ranking so low nationally on this national NAEP test, yet they're ranking so high on their state tests? There was this big gap in saying, why is 76% of eighth grade students passing the Oklahoma standardized test, but only 20% of them are, are passing the NAEP test? The answer to that is the highest that the NAEP eighth grade math test has ever been is 44%. There's never been a state score higher than 44% on the eighth grade math test when it comes to NAEP. And the reason why is because it's not a grade level test. They're testing eighth graders on general knowledge of math, not an eighth grade test. Oklahoma is testing eighth graders based on eighth grade standards, not eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth general knowledge. So when you're looking at these scores, okay, and why are they so low? All right, when they do the cut scores for um, these tests, they make sure it matches where they want Oklahoma to rank when it comes to NAP. So the state test matches what the national test is. It's a joke. Okay. Thank you, Darcy. I'll sit down. <laughs> you guys, email me. Before Chris, uh, I, I didn't want to fill in a couple of blanks there before Chris uh, uh -huh. starts on the high school. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Rainwater. I'm sorry. Uh, when you look at what we're doing from third grade and really from pre K through because that's really what we're talking about. Um, seven years ago when we started this, when I, when I became superintendent, and it's, that kind of coincided with a whole lot of the report card and this focus on scores and things like that. And I can remember sitting in some of those meetings with the administrators where I wasn't sure that they weren't going to become suicidal or at least, at least need counseling. Uh, and that's when we changed the conversation to focus on where we are as opposed to the state average. Because we're funded similarly in each district in this state for what we can do in the classroom. And so the measure of the work our teachers are doing needs to be bounded by the state average. As a state, if we want to have a discussion of raising that average, that turns into a funding discussion many times. Now, saying that to say this, if you look at, and, and this trend of the scores has held, even though we've changed ways we've measured it, the trend has held where the third grade are about where they have been. And by the time they're in eighth grade, they are above the state average. And that has been consistent in the last seven years. That tells me that we are growing these kids. And that's why when I first look at these, you know, when I look at the third grade and I, I kind of get down in the dumps and then I look at the, and I go through all of it and I see what we're doing, and then I'm reminded this happens every year. And that's, that's a tribute to our faculty and staff for taking a kid in pre-K that may not have the, the, the abilities of the average Oklahoma student. And by the time they're in eighth grade, they exceed those abilities. And that's something that, and, and we, we now have a seven year picture of that that has been consistent. So, uh, sorry, Chris, but I didn't want to 
No, but since in fact, that's, you took the words out of my mouth because I was going to say as a high school principal, that's very encouraging to me because we know where our kids are when we get them. And you can see that they've continued to progress as they go up from elementary into junior high. And, and uh, now, <clears throat> as far as high school is concerned, this is kind of new territory for us <coughs> this year because um, our scores are based on the ACT, which we've been wanting that for quite some time in the past. We've everything has been based on the end of the instruction exams in each of the four <coughs> subject areas, and so now the data that we're given is directly from our ACT results. And uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll we'll go ahead and get started then. With, uh, here and I've got to clarify exactly this information <coughs> what this means as far as the percentage well uh, what ACT has done is they've been able to set a, a standard what they call the college readiness benchmark scores and there's a range of these scores but basically they're saying that if a student can make an 18 or better on their ACT their sub score in English then they have a 50% chance of scoring at least a C or higher on a college level comparable class or a 75% chance of scoring at least a C or higher, okay? So with that being said, uh, there's, a, there's a benchmark score that they've given and, and basically what they did is they tracked these students as they went into college and they compared their score, sub scores on the, the different parts of the ACT to a college level class and they've been able to come up with some empirical data to show that this is about what a student will achieve in a college level class. And so with that being said, uh, statewide this year on the ACT, these are the juniors, the ones we looked at uh, in the earlier slide that Doug gave were the graduating seniors of 2018. These are juniors that will graduate this spring in, in 2019, and 16% uh, of our kids met those college benchmark standards. The, the state average was 20%. So uh, we're just a little bit behind there. Um, and I'm gonna go through each one and then I'm gonna tell you some things that we're kind of doing to improve our scores in this area. 11th grade English. English on the ACT and read, readings, reading English is more usage and grammar and punctuation. Uh, and we've kind of gotten away from that a little bit. And so we're gonna try to emphasize that a little bit more and get back to that. Uh, is, you guys probably know kids today do a lot of uh, texting and get on social media and I wouldn't say that their usage and grammar and spelling skills are real apt. Uh, if anything, they're inept, but uh, I think that probably contributes a little bit to that. But uh, at the same time, we're gonna make an emphasis and, and our teachers are doing a really good job of using a lot of this grammar work as I go around to the classrooms as their board starters when they're walking in and they have to correct sentences and. I, I think it's good practice for the ACT. Uh, in science, it's 16 to 20 percent uh, uh, as far as the, the percent. And again, if you look at statewide and all the kids are taking tests, you think 20 percent, that's not very good. But again, we're testing every, every junior in, in our school and in the state. And uh, not all of these kids, as I mentioned earlier, are actually going to go on to college. Uh, but uh, they are taking the test and uh, you can see here the reading is, is where we've really closed the gap uh, compared to the other. There's just a few percentage points behind 28 and 30 percent. And again, this is what ACT considers uh, college readiness benchmark scores. And so what we're doing, uh, and I can already see the results because as I look at this, I've got the data from last year too. And in English alone last year, we had a discrepancy of 14 percentage points, whereas this year our, our discrepancy was seven. So we pretty much cut that in half in one year. Uh, and I, I should probably put that up there too. And then uh, in reading, there was a discrepancy between last year's seniors and this year's juniors of 10 percentage points between district and state. And this year, as you can see, there's only 2%. 
so I can see it right there. But what we're doing uh, is we're working on ACT prep. And uh, last year we had 50 site licenses that the kids were using during power hour. This year we've got 100. And what I'm going to do is I'm waiting until January to start those kids on ACT prep. Last year we started in September and 30 each month we're working on it. Well, by the time they took the test in April, out of sight, out of mind. So this year, with more site license, I can start in January, and we'll have about 100 kids, or 75 kids to 100 kids each month, and then when we take it in April, they've all had the opportunity to take uh, the ACT prep. Another thing that we're really, uh, it's a different from elementary school up to high school, the ACT is a time test. Uh, whereas the state test, they have all the time they want, and that is the biggest challenge of our kids when they take the ACT is that for math, there's 60 problems in 60 minutes. And so you don't have an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, unlimited time. You have to get in there and manage your time wisely. And we're also taking the pre-ACT, so Wednesday all of our sophomores will take the pre-ACT, which is basically like the ACT. And uh, that, that is a great practice test in preparation for their junior year when it actually counts. And uh, we're comparing that data from their sophomore years to their junior year to look for growth individually with our students. And I think that's gonna help. But getting back to the time, uh, our math teachers are really, whenever they get benchmark exams, they give them an hour to take the test. And so we're trying to give them the same type of scenario, such testing situation that they'll can't encounter on the ICT. Because some kids, and I mean, some people in general, they just, with time, uh, they don't do well with it. So they gotta practice it, and they gotta learn to manage their time, and there's some different test taking strategies that they can focus on in the different subject areas to help them manage that time element. But uh, we're all working hard there, and, uh, um, you know, this right here is probably the one that I'm most proud of because these, these, this is a percent of students that were uh, met the benchmark, college readiness benchmark standards in all four. Because a lot of times kids will like to be really good in English, but not very good in math. Or they're really good in math and science, but they're not very good in English. Well, these are the percent of kids that pass all four of them. And if you take our top kids at Guthrie High School and compare them to the top kids across Oklahoma, look there, I'll, I'll take our top along with everyone else. And so state average was only 11%, but if you take our top kids, and this year we have like 238 kids, that's like 23 kids, and it's probably no coincidence we have like 30 kids right now that are up for valedictorian. That's a very good indicator of uh, the percent of kids that we have that are, are, are top level kids and are scoring really high and uh, will go on to college and do great things. So anyway, that's, did I, uh, did everyone kind of get that thing? And again, it's all new to us. Um, this first year we've actually used the ACT data and uh, so we know, we kind of have an idea now what we need to focus on and work on and we'll continue to do so. And. Uh, I think uh, you're going to continue to see improvements in our scores from one year to the next. Plus, I'm, I'm pleased because we've actually, we're testing, Doug didn't mention it, but like if you compare last year, this year, uh, we actually tested like 15 more kids than we did the year before, and we either maintained or were just a little bit above what we were the year before. So I think that's improvement in and of itself. Any questions? Any questions for any of them? I had a comment, but not so much a question. And I think I made a similar comment last year. You guys have set such a high standard for yourselves. You can see the disappointment when you say, you know, we're comparing it to a 30% and a 40%. So you can see the drive and the desire that you have to improve these students. And I know that we've seen it, seen it in the reports that you've presented over the last couple of years where you know when the target keeps changing you still keep striving and every single one of you talked about how you're analyzing the data that you're getting and you're collaborating together taking ideas from one school to the other to improve so that you're preparing that for the long term and i just want to say thank you and that you know, 